Well, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I am dialing in today from uh, sunny California. So it's early morning. I believe it's afternoon for all of you in the East Coast. Thank you for having me and let's just jump in. So let me tell you my aha story. And for all of you that have grown up uh, like I did in the 70s and 80s, it's not the pop star uh, pop group that is one of my favorite out of UK. So my aha story came when I was a substitute teacher in our elementary, um, local elementary public school where my son went to school. It was a second grade uh, substitute teaching. And that was the first time that I'd done uh, substitute teaching um, in our elementary school. I tend to focus on the special education pieces of the substitute teaching in middle school and the high school. So I was given a, a, a whole list of things to do. Um, and I was told all the students know what to do. And my job was to facilitate um, doing worksheets on things that they already know, uh, do a storytelling and you know other things. So I was like, okay, great. There were 26 students uh, in the class and most students were okay. There was one boy that really stood out in my mind at that time. And between trying to, um, you know, figure out how to facilitate 26 very energetic students. This boy at the back of my mind, I started, you know, getting worried about him. And I don't know anything about any of the students in that particular class. That was the first time I was substitute teaching in that classroom. So fast forward, it became storytelling time. Everyone sat down, there he was uh, it, during, the work, during the worksheet uh, session earlier in the day. He was just walking around more interested in what other students were doing. It was very difficult to get him to uh, sit down and do the assignments. So there he was at the, at the edge of the classroom. I could kind of see him out of the side, like out of the corner of my eye. Everybody else was sitting down for the story time. I don't even remember what book we were reading. Um, but long story short, as we went into that, he was still at the corner, not really interested to join the class. And I started thinking, uh, maybe I could switch out how I was reading to the class. So I started pausing and go, well, what do you think would happen in the next page? And then most of the, uh, some students would put out their hand and be like, oh, I don't know, I think it's this and that. And, you know, it was great. And then I saw at the corner of his eye, he started coming closer to the group. And I was like, oh, that's encouraging. That's interesting too. And as we went along, um, as we went along then, by the end, he was literally sitting in the front of the whole class, highly engaged, put his hand up, and he was like the most interested, uh, you know, most highly engaged participant in the classroom. And at that time, that was my aha story. And I was like thinking, you know, there's something there going on. Many of our classrooms have a story time. So perhaps we could leverage that to do something and reach students that may otherwise, um, you know, have a difficult time connecting with the classroom. So that's my aha story. Let's move on. So a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in Singapore and uh, within the U.S. I came when I was 18 and I've uh, lived in different parts of the U.S. It's very interesting to me um, how different culturally uh, language usage um, and things like and education systems are uh, within the different states. So um, as I said earlier, with that aha moment, that has always been at the back of my mind that at some point, at some time, when I have time and when I find great collaborators, I like to work in teams, that that's something I really would like to do. Um, I'm also a parent of two uh, gifted children. My daughter is 18, she just turned 18, and my son is 16. So I've been on this journey as a parent a little bit longer. Um, and my background isn't in gifted education, it's really in human development psychology. And I came in the last um, 10, 12 years towards to be connected with the gifted community and gifted education because of my own parenting. And how what I do is at the bottom right hand side, I use a human centered lifespan approach when I look at and consider and kind of think about um, you know, education and gifted education. So I'm kind of in many places. Um, currently I'm the immediate past president at SANG, the supporting emotional needs of the gifted. Um, that is a 
passion area in terms of what is inside of us um, is very, um, and, and how do we find ways to uh, build skills, resiliency um, from within outwards. Um, I'm currently also engaged in several research studies around parenting. So if there's any interest, please feel free to reach out to us. We are recruiting for 2025 um, research study participants. So here are some definitions. What is human-centered lifespan approach? Sounds like a mouthful. So you'll see, and I'm not going to read it up uh, for you, that that is a you know, more scholarly definition. But I do want to read to you uh, at the bottom, and these are these quotes are in uh, different parts of the Using Picture book book that I had um, written, had the honor to write with uh, one of my doctoral students, uh, Gail Bentley, who is now has graduated and we collaborate together and we're actually doing that research study together. So this might give you a better sense of what human centered lifespan approach means. Today you are you, that is truer than true. There is no one alive who is youer than you, from Dr. Seuss. Um, another one would be you are a whole person, a sum of more than our parts. We all have strengths and weaknesses. And then the best gift anyone can give, I believe, is the gift of sharing ourselves themselves uh, from Oprah Winfrey. And then last but not least, our children are living, breathing human beings with their own characteristics, preferences apart from us. So the only thing I would add to that from a human-centered lifespan approach is that our goal is living a life that's rich and fulfilling um, at school and beyond the school. So that's the lifespan pieces of things. And then two other definitions real briefly would be authentic because you will hear it coming up later on. Authentic listening means we're being out here. So if you find yourself listening uh, with a lot of attention and then at the same time in your head, you're thinking in your head stuff or you're running something, a script in your head, that's not quite authentic listening. So authentic listening is really being out here in the moment in that conversation, um, really being led by the other person. And dialogue, um, you know, the way I would use dialogue is the purpose of a dialogue is for understanding, it's not to go anywhere. So the goal of a dialogue is having a conversation and that's the goal. We're not trying to go somewhere, trying to resolve something and trying to do anything. So um, when I use the term dialogue, that's what I mean by that. So why books? Um, I had already shared the, the aha moment. Um, a lot of times we are, we, we're all very busy. Um, how can we leverage limited time? So um, today's session is about using books as a tool for greater understanding and having conversations, building relationships with your child and your student. Um, and this is, books is just one way I would encourage you if books are not um, a practical or accessible ways, then you could think of other types of tools that allows you to learn more about your child and your student. And at the same time for, um, for them to learn about themselves within a safe um, environment. It, books are also a great way for creating safe spaces because when we're discussing and talking about a book, um, in some ways we could be talking about your child and your student, uh, but we're really talking about the book and at the same time. So that might be some ways. They are, um, many of us are well aware of academic benefits of book reading. So here are some that I've listed here. Um, and there are also non-academic benefits of um, reading books or engaging in um, you know, book reading, whether it's being read to you, you're, you're reading. The point of the books is using that uh, for relationship building. So not self-reading the book per se, but there are some benefits to that too, obviously. Um, for purposes of understanding each other, it requires at least two people or more people on that. So I'm not going to go over all of that because that's um, quite long, but it is here uh, on here for us to know and read through. What I'm really eager 
to share with you today during our limited time together is some um, examples of uh, what types of books I'm talking about uh, or examples of books and how we would use that. So, so let's play this video. C is for curiosity, read by Christian Go. Marveling at the big and small, Wondering what is above and below. Music everywhere, waiting to be heard. What do you hear? Paper transformed to a square night. A plastic bag turned backpack. I can't wait to see your creations. Look. Edible art, as a wait. Reading opportunities abound, from a boba tea shop to the botanical gardens. Even when waiting at the airport. And now. Experiential learning, highly recommended. Time to make a foil sculpture garden. Optical illusions, very funny. Still processing. Some things are endlessly fascinating. Share yours. Out the TARDIS in a blink, right next to 221B Bear Street. Wandering about, wandering in Wonderland. Off the beaten path, often includes stopping on our way to another place. Pause to experience. I feel to shit rocking, which leads me to ponder to be or not to be. Important to reset as necessary. What do you do to reset? Hmm. What is in this normal store? Move it. Yes. Get greater joy when I'm free to create my space. What are they trying to say? Um, I'm not sure. Looking through my lens, things are crystal clear. Yet no words describe how I feel most times. This is what handwriting feels like. Do you see my alphabets? Trying to explain time travel requires recharging. Battery ran out. Till next time, stay curious. So I'm going to show another video and then we'll debrief um, the two videos. And as you're watching the video, just sort of note what is going through your mind. Let's figure out how to go to the next slide. An animal school, a tale of gifts. Once upon a time, a school was formed for animals to learn skills needed in our future world. Swimming, flying, climbing, and running were chosen as the subject areas. To be fair, all students were to participate in three out of the four areas and be at least average 
in the subjects they chose. Gariel was an excellent swimmer, an average runner, and a very poor climber. Gariel had to stop working on swim moves, which Gariel enjoyed doing, in order to spend more time on learning to climb. At the end of the school year, Gariel managed to get average grades, as it was the goal at school. Everyone thought Gariel was doing just fine. However, Gariel was worried about losing an edge in swimming. Sugar Glider Possum was excellent at flying, leaping and gliding from treetops. However, Eagle, the instructor, said the right way of flying was from the ground up. Sugar Glider Possum spent so much time practicing ground takeoffs. Sugar Glider Possum was too exhausted to do anything else. At the end of the school year, Sugar Glider Possum had below average grades and was labelled a failure at school. Margay, the arboreal cat, started as a top and popular student. Other animals welcomed Margay, as Margay looked like the leopards already at school. Margay soon became bored with classes, but still enjoyed the company of other students. Margay was labelled a troublemaker for having a different way to complete tasks and having different interests from the leopards. Margay often spent time in detention and was told to be more like the leopards. By the end of the year, Margay earned good grades as it was far too easy. A copy was a new student from a faraway land. No one had ever met an animal like a copy. As a copy looked familiar, and yet not. The ponies, zebras, and other animals often made fun of a copy. Even though a copy seemed fine, a copy's grades suffered from being picked on and from the social isolation. For peacock mantis shrimp who lived in the water, running, climbing, swimming and flying were all the same. Peacock mantis shrimp's great passion was boxing. But the subject was not taught at the animal school. Peacock mantis shrimp dropped out before the end of the year. With the encouragement of those that believed in Peacock Mantis Shrimp's passions and gifts outside of the school, Peacock Mantis Shrimp found joy. Peacock Mantis Shrimp practiced and ended up having one of the fastest and most powerful punches in the animal kingdom. Bumblebee was the biggest problem of all. Bumblebee was an animal the school could not handle. What are we going to do with Bumblebee? said the teachers and classmates. We just don't understand. How can Bumblebee learn to fly? Bumblebee's wings are too small for such a body size. Bumblebee did not pay attention to the other's words and Bumblebee continued practicing. Over time, Bumblebee began to fly 
just like Bumblebee's ancestors. In the end, the school worked for some animals, but not for others. How can we make sure our schools are helping all students grow? Our children are precious. Just like snowflakes, similar yet unique. Possessing different gifts, interests and personalities. It is our job to find opportunities for gifts and interests to shine and grow. When we nurture diversity, strengths and gifts, our children will be best prepared to flourish in a future world we have yet to encounter. Our seeds planted will help them to grow. So I've shown you two videos that are uh, produced and it is publicly available. So feel free to um, use them as you see fit. And here are some ideas. This is just a few. There's many, many different ways that you can um, use the book. So these two are books that we have also um, produced as videos because trying to buy a lot of books could get very expensive. Um, so many of the books that we recommend, um, you'll see on the other page that came from the Using Picture Books book, um, are all available uh, as read alouds online. So there's absolutely no... Um, you know, barriers in terms of trying to find suitable books um, that, you know, you're not sure if you do want to invest in purchasing the books. So here are some ideas here, uh, just some amongst many, and, um, you know, would love to hear uh, people's ideas too, in terms of how would you use the books? Um, not just this book, but is an example of picture books. Uh, we do like to use books with uh, not a lot of words on there. The purpose of that is to um, allow more openness in terms of um, hearing from your child and children, sort of like what's going on with them. So when it's more visual and less words, uh, that allows for greater interpretation on uh, openness in interpretation from everyone on there. So for animal school, for example, some of the ideas that we've tried out um, that was interesting was, experiment. for example, that you may or may not have thought about would be to experiment with the playback speed. So I was playing that video at 125% uh, of the speed. Uh, when the video was made, the uh, intention was to do a slower um, narration speed so that it may match or um, for, for, because there are words on each page that that would, was the intent was to match the reading speed. However, everyone is different. So experimenting with the playback speed uh, was very interesting. So I'll give you an example when we did that and had everybody, so we started playing that video, the animal school video at different speeds and it just had people notice you know, at what speed seemed to be a more optimal rate for um un, for comprehension, and then um then we would share what's going on with that, and then after that, uh, I would say, did you guys notice what's going on with the video? Most of us were so <laughs> focused on you know listening to the playback speed, most people couldn't really tell what what happened you know in in the story, um and a funny side um thing with this video was made, I would say two, three years ago. And it took one child that was doing um, like a book critique and he saw our video and he wrote us to say that, did you know that you have a spelling mistake in the video? None of us, and we had quite a few eyes working on it, noticed it for the longest time and no one had ever said it. And it was, it took a little child, not little, but a child, uh, I think he was nine years old to uh, send a note to us to say that, 
you know, uh, did you notice that? And then going back, we did like, oh my God, now it's glaring in our heads, but we haven't had time to redo the video, uh, you know, on our side. So um, I would invite you without maybe sharing that to see if anyone noticed that. So there is actually a spelling error on, um, actually it's several, um, you know, scenes in there. Um, and again, that's super fascinating. So uh, other things you could do is you can invite, you know, your children to share what they saw, what was interesting to them. What did they literally see? Are they more captivated by something else on the periphery that's going on or the main characters? Um, you know, as you're going through the story in the video, you know, note what self-reflection initial reactions you might have, what comes to your mind. Um, you know, does it remind you of certain uh, children, yourself, things like that? Um, and those could be, you know, good ways to facilitate a conversation, a dialogue. Uh, how about the other animals in the story that we didn't highlight on there? Um, perhaps you might have a child that is really into animals um, and that you could start there. So really starting with what you know about your child already that may, may capture their um, attention or interest um, on there. Sometimes what I do with the um, you know, animal school for the video would be like, hey, you know, I need to do some homework. Could you help me out? Like, for example, with the playback speed type of things. Um, and then, you know, people like to be helpful. And I'm sure the children would be, um, that would be an opportunity for them to shine and sort of be, uh, to contribute to towards something. For the C for curiosity usage ideas, um, if you look at it, it's highly visual. Uh, it touches upon some of the things that we may be concerned about for, um, you know, within the education setting, educational setting about our children. For example, you know, in there, there was something about, you know, difficulty explaining um, feelings. Uh, there was, uh, you know, handwriting. Uh, my son has pretty severe dysgraphia. He's 16 and pretty much his handwriting still looks the same. Um, so that, that, that was something there. Um, other things would be, I think the very first uh, few photos showed him literally when we're walking, usually our eyesight would be sort of centered around where we're walking, uh, you know, like around there. But for him, he really um, is, you know, he notices all the surrounding stuff. So for example, if you have a child like that it, within the classroom setting, and that's what I noticed for my son, was that when he goes into the classroom, if you allow him some time to uh, kind of take in all the, all the classroom, and then he can focus on what's going on in the actual classroom itself. So sometimes for him, uh, oftentimes for him, what we do is we'll bring him into an unknown um, environment to allow him time just for the purpose of absorbing, observing, whatever's going on in the classroom. And I noticed for him in terms of, especially when the um, doing any work that requires more um, like experiential pieces of things, like building a marshmallow, um, you know, dome project, for example, um, it was a lot, um, we get a lot more cooperation and participation and interest when I just allow him to just play around with the materials, no instructions first. And then about five minutes or so. And then I tell him, hey, you know, just these are some of the stuff we're going to work on today. And, you know, I'm going to play around with it. After that, when I go, hey, I need you to help me out. It's my homework, which it was actually for that particular thing. That could you follow the instructions and then build this thing and then give me your feedback as to, you know, what you think about the instructions. So um, I got a lot more um, cooperation from him when I do allow, build in extra time to allow him to just kind of tinker around with the material. And that's not true, necessarily true for all students um, and children. So really depending on the case. Um, and those are some other things would be um, that you can do would be for every page, you could also, you know, do the same things I did, like, what, what might be happening next? Or what do you think is going on? Uh, you know, what is interesting to you? Or what is not interesting to you? And then have a dialogue about that. And through those dialogue, uh, Animal School, C for Curiosity, and other um, children's books, uh, picture books, I'm going to show you in the next uh, slide, you, um, you know, when you have a, when you have created, and that would be a prerequisite, a, a, uh, 
good trusting relationships that allows you your child um, to share with you authentically um, and truthfully what is going on um, inside in terms of how do they experience the world. And through that, that gives you additional information um, that would be helpful to you in terms of, oh, now you have more data points. And that would be um, something that is um, different than our perception and based on what we observe of um, behavior, sort of, you know, you just want to get more data points. So we mentioned that many books can be found online as read aloud. Um, uh, these are some topics that came up from uh, that we felt that was um, we wanted to share with our audience. That was the on the right hand side, you see the little picture there. That's the um, using picture books. It came out of an independent study with my uh, one of our doctoral students at Bridges Graduate School, who is now has graduated Gail. Um, these are some of the topics in the book. Uh, there are, I think, eight chapters in there. Um, and within that, there are 42 curated picture books uh, with a little summary, uh, again, because there's just a lot of material out there. Um, so we do a little summary on there, sort of what we liked about the book and perhaps what type of child may gravitate to the book. Um, there are some books that are beautifully illustrated. So if you have a child uh, that has a, an eye for, um, you know, an uh, artistic eye, that they, that's something that they care about that would draw them, then those are some of the things on there. So coming from top down, um, we have a chapter on, for example, what if my child seems different? Um, on there. And through the uh, different books, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be books, but finding different ways to perhaps, um, you know, find out a little bit more on their end. Um, and then you can reflect on what you observe about the child, about your child on there. And then how to bring out the best in our child. Um, and we, we, our approach is we always lead with strengths. So I have here, um, one example of um, one of the books that we had recommended on there. Um, I believe this is uh, now because my children are much older and I'm not familiar in particular with uh, this particular character. It is actually uh, a TV series also. Um, so that's uh, one that might be of interest to you. And another one would be, how do you help your child accept themselves and others? I'm going to show a little bit. I think we have a little bit of time. I'm going to just show you real briefly, not every single one, but um, the big umbrella is an illustration of uh, what we're talking about. Welcome to education.com, your home for expertly crafted resources to help your friendly umbrella. It likes to help. It likes to spread its arms wide. It loves to give shelter. It loves to gather people in. It doesn't matter if you are tall or hairy, or plaid. It doesn't matter how many legs you have. Some people worry that there won't be enough room under the big umbrella. But the amazing thing is, there is. There is always room. Let's remember there's always enough room under the umbrella and in our hearts for all. Thank you for reading with me. Come back soon. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Books with Blue. Again, we were really surprised that really all the books that we had recommended, the 42 books were um available online as read alouds on there. Um, and that also inspired us to uh, make sure that we create the animal school and see for curiosity so that it is um, just free and available for anyone and everyone on there. 
So here's, I, I guess I will show one uh, more example. Um, I really like this one, how to build empathy. So I'm going to show you. Jenny may have said. My friend Jenny May is sad. But you might not be able to tell. Even when she's sad, she still smiles. Hi, pal. And shares her orange with Harold and admires Izzy's drawings. And she really likes to make everyone laugh. Jenny May is hilarious. But some days are not as fun. Rip. Hey, why did you do that, Jenny May? Uh, so that was uh, the uh, author and illustrator that had just uh, read a little bit that I've just shown you that read a little bit about the Jenny May um, story. So here are some things here. So the topics we cover, um, what if my child is perfectionist? And then the ones in the brackets would be, for example, showed, in, um, you know, some of the books would um, show that making mistakes is how we learn. Um, how to calm a worried child. Um, some of the things would be to, to model and let them know we, we get worried too sometimes and how can we help. Um, building empathy, adult modeling and encouragement. And then how to help your child accept themselves and others to pair self-acceptance. And it's um, critical that as adults, we also practice self-acceptance and we pair that with self-esteem building opportunities. And we lead with strengths. So last but not least, um, you know, spread the love. Uh, Gail Bentley is hosting a parenting for young gifted children pilot through Sang um, as our partner. Um, she will be co-facilitating um, six weeks with this based on her book that she wrote. So if there's any interest there, um, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to share um, that opportunity if people are interested in that. Um, and that's what I have for now. Should I unshare my screen, Denise? That was wonderful. Thank you so much. So many takeaways um, from what you shared with us, including matching reader speed, not using a lot of words, getting their initial reactions to things, honoring the child's unique approach to learning. So many great points. I have a question for you um, that I was thinking as you were speaking. So if the parents use these kinds of um, conversations or dialogue, as you've called it, then how, what are ways you would suggest they bridge their conversations at home to school so the conversations could be had in both places? Yeah, that's a great question, Denise. Um, that's why we love books because, you know, schools typically, especially in the um, elementary ages, would have a reading time oftentimes. So the books that we really feel like that may be helpful uh, to continue having a conversation with schools to just increase greater awareness, I would say, you know, donate a book, uh, talk to the librarian and be like, hey, do you have this book? You know, if they don't know about it, you could introduce that to the book, that book to the library um, classrooms. If you're part of uh, your school's PTA, perhaps that's something if this, your school is not able to afford, uh, some books could get very pricey, that that could be something you could do as a gift to the school. The more um, opportunities for these books to be read, again, perhaps not really with the interest of like doing whatever it is we're doing from education and parenting, uh, it just creates an that a greater awareness. Um, so I think the, the very first part, if you are building the collaborative um, 
types of relationship that um, sometimes less is more. You don't have to say, why you really, you know, like you just say, oh, we love this book. And, you know, we wanted to, you know, have this in the classroom, perhaps even invite your child if, if you're gifting the book to the classroom and you're able to, uh, to read it, you know, like with the teacher to have some like leadership experience. Um, or perhaps if you, you know, offer to go, hey, I'm happy to come do reading day today. And I wanted to introduce this book and maybe ask students, you know about it, if you love it. Again, letting people know you don't have to read the book. You could do the read alouds. Uh, you know, it's freely available online. A lot, every single one that uh, we've we've found so far. Um, you know, on there. So that would be um, again, depending on what your goal is, relationship building, or the you know, if your initial in the initial part, I think just sharing like we love these books. You know, could we could we donate to the classroom? We would love for other students to know about it. Might be a good way. Thank you so much. Are some great tips for bridging home with classroom? The other thought I was having while you were mentioning um, emphasizing relationships is I think what we take for granted as parents that we show our children how to form relationships with other adults and how we interact with them. And books is a great way to do that. And I think that um, when the second question occurred to me, I was thinking, how could kids communicate with their teachers what they read with their parents last night and the kinds of discussions they had? But when parents do this kind of reading that you're suggesting at home, showing their children how to have those conversations when they get to school with the um, trusted adults at their school. So I think that really helps with that too. Yeah, it's like the rehearsal practice uh, sort of thing. And, and um, you know, I think those are great. I would um, kind of caution that really um, it, this really would work best when you have built, really emphasize on the relationship building more than the, I'm trying to get information from my child. Uh, and that's important too. But what you want to get is real information that's truly what your child is thinking. Uh, so that requires the prerequisite would be, um, you know, perhaps you're using not just this book, any book that they like first as the safe space. And books is one um, for us, we view it as a tool. Um, perhaps if, if books are not, you know, your thing per se or something like that, it could be any other thing. Like it could be um, through, uh, you might be a musical family and music is your like safe space type of stuff. Then perhaps what you could do, which we do have in our book, uh, a bridge to that would be, we do actually have a book about uh, something about an orchestra. I can't remember the title right now that you could then maybe select strategically books that are of interest to your child first as a way to continue building relationships based on interest. And then, you know, depending on the case, you could then start broaching other topics that you might be concerned about as a parent or are wondering about maybe that's a better way to say it would be to wonder um, about things. And the fact that you mentioned contributing a book to the classroom library is an easy way to transform your classroom each year to the needs of the kids who are coming into your classroom. So that, that suggestion is very um, appreciated. So thank you for that. Yeah, I think, oh, you know, teachers, we can't have more books, right? Like, I mean, we never, <laughs> like, more books is great, you know? I don't think any teacher would be like, oh, we have enough books, we don't need more books. It's, you know, we're all curious, and we like to kind of see, especially if it's a book you're not aware of uh, on there. So there are a few, perhaps, classic books, and we try to pick some that you may not um, be familiar with. So one last question, and that's around vocabulary building. So what would you suggest to import some of the vocabulary building in a classroom after you've had these discussions at home and these great um, reading opportunities with your children and, and looking at or talking about all different vocabulary. How would you suggest we do that? Integrate that into the classroom. Yeah, one of the things I Even actually... Home. Yeah, home and classroom. One of the things I really um, am really gravitating to and really appreciating more and more is this, what I would call a mood check. So you know, being really careful thinking about the words we use, um, and this is not the, the right time to, to put it, but, um, I would prefer to use the, the word mood and feelings versus emotions, because emotions is a label on a set of um, phys physical feelings and, you know, stuff like that. So using mood and feelings is a lot more open, because for example, uh, when someone says, oh, I feel anxious, 
uh, or if they describe something to you at your child or another person and you're like, oh, you, that's, you feel anxious. A lot of the similar feelings, for example, the butterfly in your tummy, you know, that all that stuff that could be anxiety or feeling anxious could also be excitement. So I think really, um, especially with younger children or, or not that older children is different, but really starting from being aware of the feelings, like the physical, like my heart's beating really fast, like the specific pieces of things. Uh, and then uh, there are, you know, ways to describe them that could be honest in a more positive uh, and productive way. Because um, then that, that's a whole other field that, that I'm, you know, into in terms of, again, that label emotions. So if we could do mood check every day, perhaps some of the things we could um, have in a classroom at home, let's do a mood check, you know, at the beginning of the day, uh, especially, you know, or throughout the day, maybe have the kids, you know, let's all I put, you know, whatever it is on there and let's see how our class is feeling today. That might be a good way to uh, sort of scaffold without having a specific lesson. I mean, we're all busy. <laughs> Teachers are very busy. Uh, it's like, okay, do we want more things? So the more we can, quote unquote, multi, like kind of embed them into what we're already doing in the classroom, um, you know, that just becomes just, a, we just take it for granted. And we really do want to, in this case, take that for granted where we're just doing mood checks. We're, you know, like, like okay, what's going on? And we feel comfortable with that. So I did say one more question before I ask you the vocabulary question, <laughs> sure. but it leads me to another one. What about communicating through writing Definitely. after they've had this dialogue? What would you suggest to do with that? That would be great. And um, I think what I would say would be maybe have them build their own story. In fact, we are working on the animal school workbook as a way to be like, you know, because we did show some other animals, which we didn't talk about, or, you know, they're in terms of illustration, we're like, well, you know, what other animal? Imagine if you have, an, you know, like another, which is like another student, right? Uh, sort of like, what would it be like? How, how would you, you know, how, how could you help, you know, how could you make this animal or student, uh, you know, uh, be, feel welcome and you know things like that so that's absolutely awesome I do want to make sure when we say writing we really mean, mean it could be writing it could be like do a video you know just different ways of expression especially if you do have kids where the physical writing is an impediment to the ideas so um, again depending on um, what the purpose is I would say if it's something difficult you don't want to take something enjoyable and pair it with something that's not enjoyable and absolutely Absolutely, uh, to, to kind of take away that, um, you know, depending on what your purpose is. So I would, uh, I think those are great suggestions. Maybe have the kids be like, you know, who would like to maybe write, share a story? Who would like to act it out? Maybe, you know, just different ways of expressing, because I think we're interested in their expression about what they've seen more than unless it's a homework, <laughs> like an assignment, uh, you know, which, which is okay too, but we can see how we can sort of continue um, that exploration that would be encouraging and not sort of a turn off, like, oh, no way, no, I'll do that. Those are all great suggestions. Those are all great suggestions too. So thank you so much for that. Oh, it's my pleasure. So I'm glad that you shared some of the books. I'm glad you showed us where to find them. If we're curious that we want to add more tools to our toolbox, um, we will go ahead and share those on our end as well and make those available to parents yeah and i'm happy to i don't think i included the email i mean the Google, whatever youtube links of uh you know the stuff uh from our books those those are freely available um and we did that okay, so here's here's the other tricky um, part of this so we have parents on here of middle school students we have parents of high school students i am familiar with some of the books that have no words um that are at the high school level and middle school level, what would you suggest using with middle schoolers and high school level students to have some of that dialogue or to encourage that? Dialogue? That is actually something we have been thinking about. So the, um, I guess the challenge is that there are just 
a lot of books out there. And when we're looking at and evaluating the books for our purposes, depending on what they are, um, we're looking at it from building the social emotional like kind of pieces of things, then we would curate the books based on that. So some of the things we want to be for us that we want to be mindful about would be really think about what is your philosophy? What are your values personally as a family and things like that? Uh, for us, we use strength. We lead with strengths. So we want to be mindful when we're like looking at a book to evaluate that, to share with our child. We're looking at, are they using languages that's really focused on all like deficit stuff only, for example. So it's not that the books are not, um, you know, not, it's not that the books are not necessarily good or bad. It's more like, does it fit what we're trying to do? Is it going to give, is it in alignment with the messaging we would like to impart on our child? Uh, because you don't want to, share a book, then you're like, this book is awesome. And the messaging is not what aligned to your values, uh, for example. And there's and the hard thing is there's no right or wrong. That's the difficult things uh, on there. So if you have, uh, if you're a child or if you love a, a particular series, I would look at them from that, critique the book from those lenses. Is it giving the messages that you want to give personally as your family values that align with your values on there. So we have not, that was like um, both Gail and my kids are, as you guys know, older. <laughs> so we were like, oh, we probably need an older, you know, like a set uh, for older, uh, you know, for older children, uh, well, teens, you know, on that side too. Uh, that said, I wouldn't necessarily say that you know, it's it's demeaning or sort of less when you have less words. Uh, it could be, you know, you could maybe use it as um, something, you know, some other way. So it's not about the reading part. Um, things that are more open, that more visual. It could be like an art, uh, what do you call it? Art table book, you know, the artistic ones. If it fits, the point is to use that as an entry point to talk about things, how maybe they might perceive things differently. Um, than you you do so uh, it sounds like there is already a lot of stuff out there you don't necessarily have to create them we focus on the young children's space because we're not seeing as much of that those at the younger ages uh, a lot of the storybooks for younger children are meant to be just a story like not necessarily intentionally doing certain things so that's why we started with this um you know, sort of focusing on this age group. If you think about it, just like a muscle, right? You want as much time and, and opportunities to build on those muscles over time. So that was our intention to do that. Um, for middle school, yeah, middle school ages and stuff. Yeah, you could do even audible, like audiobooks nowadays, you do have a lot. So, so we haven't focused, yeah. So. so getting down to the nitty gritty of that question, you haven't, uh, a child who's eight through 12 sitting at your house, your, your child, they're reading a book that they chose from the library. What would you suggest they do to strike up a conversation about what they're reading without putting pressure on them, without turning them off and starting to build that relationship about values? Yeah. Maybe asking them if, if it's a book that they chose, be like, oh, tell me about your book. Like, Why do you like it? Just to see what you know, is it the content? Is it maybe they really relate to the character, you know, like what was going on in their life? So that could also give you some insights um, in terms of, again, the authentic listening is if you're like, oh, yeah, I know I know what my child's saying, then that's not, you know, you're, you're like running a script in your mind, uh, really being open to that. And for my child, for example, um, when when they engage in you, sometimes you want to engage with them, but they may not want to engage with you at that time. So it's not, especially when you're older, I think books are is just one way. What I would say is the best thing you could do for your child with older children is anytime they say something to you, even when and my son would do that, like almost like clockwork, when I'm like that phone call was my son. <laughs> I'm like in the middle of a presentation. It's like, somehow, you know, timing wise, it seems like that. It's not personal to me, how, you know, on there. So when your child chooses, especially when you're getting into teenage years, uh, to engage with you as much as you can uh, to give them the time. And if you really cannot do that to say, I want to have this conversation, that sounds interesting. 
I'm in the middle of something. I cannot give you my full attention. You're saying uh, you're important to me and also saying I cannot do that right now and I, you deserve more. Let's make an appointment and make sure you, you, you know, hold up again, you're modeling, right? That what you say, you're going to do that. I think that's probably the best thing you could do just right off the top of my head uh, that tells your child they're important to them. They deserve the time. Just the time that they want to engage with you isn't necessarily the right time. However, you are like making time for them, even if it's one minute, um, you know, anything you enjoy. We have the best uh, conversations, for example, going to the grocery store. So in the car, no other distraction in general, sometimes, somehow. Um, so find different or notice different uh, what's going on in your life with your child uh, or teen where you seem to find spaces for that dialogue. Um, it could be unexpected to you. And then perhaps you could leverage that you don't really don't need to go to the grocery store. But you could say, hey, I need to go buy some stuff. Could you come with me? Because somehow you notice for whatever reason, for example, that, oh, some, some, you know, they're more open for whatever reason when you're trying to go somewhere uh, to go grocery shopping, you know. So that becomes well, another space, right? To build positive relationship. It's like a great experience for them. Guess what? We They will want more of that great experience with you. Makes good sense. Thank you again, Dr. Go. We appreciate your time and hope to have some dialogue with you in the future. Sounds great. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much.